Have you ever been impressed by somebody else's praying? I know I have. It seems like some others at times can just pray so eloquently, so greatly. And you really sense for many of them their heart behind their prayer. You know, prayer is something that we are supposed to be doing. It is part of our righteous acts as we've been looking at Jesus' words on performing righteous acts in front of others. As we continue in his word on the Sermon on the Mount, last week we had looked at his the opening words of his on prayer and the idea of religious leaders at the time praying on street corners and standing up in the sanctuary in the in the synagogue so that they could be noticed by others it wasn't ever about their heart it was about their own pride and wanting to seem holier more holy than those around them so they would get up and make this big scene about themselves and we looked at it, you know, it was about like all of Jesus's words here on the Sermon on the Mount. He goes right to the heart of the matter. It's not about the outward act as much as it is about the heart that makes you perform the act. And so last week we talked about, you know, instead of praying in public spaces and making a big scene, Jesus said to go in your closet, close a door, and to pray in secret, and that your Father who sees in secret would reward you. And again, the idea wasn't just, you know, against outward or, or public praying. It was more about your heart when you went to pray. And what you did in secret, or what we do in secret, many times speaks more about us than what those outside may see us do. And so that was his point. And then today he goes on to give more instruction on prayer, again, contrasting us to the Gentiles or the unbelievers or even the hypocrites and how they would pray and use numerous words or maybe they would pray for so long. And so today we're going to continue on in Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 7 through 8. And just take these two verses and see what Jesus has to say. Again, I thank you for joining us. My name is Gerald with Innovate Church in Kannapolis. Still not meeting yet, just in case things decide to turn around for the worse. But we still want to come on here and give God's word to you and pray that he is honored and glorified and that you may be blessed and encouraged by his word. So again, today, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 through 8 says, And when you pray... Do not heap up empty, empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So again, he's contrasting what he requires of us in our prayers versus those that are just adding empty words, empty phrases. Some translations say babbling. It says, do not just use empty babble or do not just babble on in your prayers. And it reminds me of somebody trying to tell me a story of something that had happened. You know, and they want to include every little minute detail. And yet the details that they were wanting to include didn't affect the story at all. But they felt they needed to include them. So it makes a, a two minute telling of a story five, 10 minutes or 15 minute telling story. When you kind of just think in your head, you just get to the point. Tell me what it is that you're, you're trying to, to tell me or trying to share with me. And I don't mean to be rude with that, but that's what comes to mind with this. And he says, do not be like them. Do not be like those that just offer up word after word repetitively or maybe lots of words just so that they can say that they pray longer than someone else. You know, the, the word that is used here is actually translates to empty phrases, but it's also meant to be chatter, long-winded, stammer, or repeat. It's kind of like me sitting here delivering a word to you. Could I go on for an hour, hour, or hour and a half for sure, there's lots more into this, but I always want to keep these messages short and brief as I can to get to the point. 
So usually it's 20 minutes or so. You know, it's always my hope. What Jesus was saying is when we pray, don't use words just for words sake. The more words that you add are not going to necessarily change the outcome of the prayer. And that was another thing that was going on at the time and that is still taught today in some religions, including those back then, was that the more or the longer they prayed, the more likely they believed their prayer was to be answered. And so they would pray lengthy prayers. And I'm sure you kind of know what it's like to be trying to tell something or pray something and you end up repeating yourself or you end up adding into it words that have no real meaning to them just to extend that time. Many of us may feel bad because we don't pray long prayers. And so I find comfort in this word from from Jesus that my short prayers, if they are from the heart, are more welcome or are just as welcome as maybe someone else who feels the desire to pray for hours on end. There's nothing wrong with doing that if it is from the heart, because Jesus himself, when he was in the garden about to be crucified, He himself prayed the same prayer, it says, three times, repeating the same words. But each time he went, he gave more feeling or had more emotion behind them because he was really trying to pour out his heart to God. And so for many of us, we may find ourselves in those situations. Again, it's not about the repetitiveness or the length of our prayers. It is about our heart behind them. We don't have to add words. We don't have to to pray longer to get God to act. Another story that comes to mind is Elijah and the prophets of Baal in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 18, where they're going out there and Elijah challenges the 400 or 450 prophets of Baal to offer a sacrifice to God and ask God to bring fire on that sacrifice. And he tells them to challenge their gods, and then he would challenge his. And so it is. it says that they prayed from morning to lunchtime. Baal, answer us. Baal, hear us. Baal, answer us. For hours, just trying to convince their supposed God to rain down fire on that sacrifice. And then the end of the story, the, the, the climax of the story, is that Elijah is able to ask God one time, even puts water on his sacrifice or on the wood, and God rains down fire. So again, it's a good contrast of a short, heartfelt, believing prayer versus a begging, a repetitive prayer. Now, you can actually look at that and even say, you know, maybe that the prophets of Baal were looking at it, so looking at their prayer so that they didn't look bad versus Elijah, who was all about making God the point of praise, the point of worship, the point of awesomeness as he was able to rain down that fire on them. And he even uh, even mocks the uh, the prophets of Baal. And then he goes on, he says, you don't need to add words and make lengthy prayers because your father knows what you need before you even pray to him or before you even ask of him. And so with that, many of us may read that one little bit, that one little verse, and then we say, well, why do I even need to pray? If God already knows what I need, then why do I need to even ask him or bring it to him? So why do we pray? I like John Calvin's words here. He says, Believers do not pray with the view of informing God about things unknown to him or of exciting him to do his duty, kind of like the prophets of Baal were trying to do, or of urging him as though he were reluctant, again, trying to change his mind. On the contrary, they pray in order that they may arouse themselves to seek him that they may exercise their faith in meditating on his promises 
that they may relieve themselves from their anxieties by pouring themselves into his bosom. In a word, that they may declare that from him alone they hope and expect, both for themselves and for others, all good things. And it's possibly what you may have heard before from Soren Kierkegaard, who says, Prayer does not change God, but it changes him who prays. So throughout the scriptures, we are told over and over to cast our cares, to bring our requests. Psalm 55 says, cast your, Psalm 55 verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So just because our Father, God, sees or knows of our needs and our desires, does that mean that he just cast them out without us ever asking? Some he does, I do not doubt. But is it possible that he has even greater things awaiting us awaiting on us to just ask because many of us may even approach our prayer or approach God and be afraid to ask for those things that we desire at Matthew 7 7 Jesus says ask and it will be given to you seek and you will be you will find knock and it will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be open so are you asking of God from your heart for the things that you really need? You know, again, it's a great contrast versus those that were just praying, just making requests, praying out loud, praying with many words or praying lengthy prayers for themselves. That's not what God wants. God wants to know what his children what they believe he can give for them or what he may have stored up for them or what he can offer to them. And he's awaiting, I keep saying awaiting, he's waiting for his children just to ask. So it's kind of like if you were a parent and your child goes and gets a gift from someone else that you could have given them because they didn't ask you, but they asked someone else. And maybe it was something you dreamt of giving that child. How does that make you feel as a parent? When they sought it from someone else because they didn't think that you would give it to them. And yet you were just waiting. Waiting for them to ask. Waiting for them to feel that they were ready or that they needed it. So that you could have given it to them because of how much you loved them. So prayer for us is about our communion with the Father. It's about building our relationship with Him as well, not about just going to Him for things that we need, which in doing so recognizes that He is our sustainer. He is the one that can supply all that we need. As Jesus later talks about, you know, we get worried about our clothes, our food, our work, our money, whatever. And God says, or Jesus says, don't worry about those things. That's what the heathen do. That's what the Gentiles do. But cast your cares on the Father and he will give you what you need. And so we recognize him as sustainer, as giver, as father, as God, as creator of all things. And we humble ourselves in prayer to him recognizing that we do need his help, recognizing that we do need him to be active in our lives and that he is the one that can provide those needs for us. And then prayer also opens the door for his blessings. And I don't mean financial blessings or work blessings, although those things can be included, but maybe it's just more spiritual growth. Maybe you need to pray that you can love your neighbor whom you have difficulty with. Maybe you need to pray that you can forgive someone that has hurt you and you can't find it within yourself to do so. 
And the Father sits up there and He's waiting for you to bring it to Him, for you to ask Him. And then Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit. Your prophecy, teaching, your healing, all these things. Maybe you desire some of those gifts. And even Paul tells us to ask if we do not have them. So if you want to be a better teacher or a pastor or preacher of God's word, then pray that God would help you do so. Pray that he would give you that gift. I have prayed myself that I would be able to love others as God has loved us, as Christ calls us to love others. Because as an introvert, I'm not real big on being around people. And so I'm more distant, but I want God to break through and change my heart to love others as he has loved us. And James says in James chapter 4, verse 2 through 3, it says, You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask God, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Again, it goes back to our heart. Jesus was contrasting the Gentiles, the hypocrites, in their prayer life as to what ours ought to be. Their prayer life was about wrong motives. It was about being praised or seen as holy and righteous, even though their inward acts were not. But for you and I, when we go to God in prayer, we need to make sure that our motives and our heart are true. That we're not seeking something that He doesn't want for us, for our own pleasure, but that it be His will. Again, we can go back to Jesus in the garden. Jesus prayed for what He wanted, which was for the cup of wrath to pass from Him, or for there to be another way for Him to save us all. But God didn't give Him what He wanted. It was Jesus said, not my will, but your will. So even though his flesh didn't want to go to the cross, didn't want to suffer the wrath of God, his obedience to God and his prayer to God was that whatever your will is, Father, that's what I most desire. So be sure that your prayer lines up with the same. When your prayers are from the heart... That's what is required. Again, it's not about the words you say. It's not about the length of your prayers. You pray with your heart, and God will answer those prayers. Doesn't mean we'll get everything we want. Again, it needs to line up with His will. But if it's from our heart, He will answer it. One of those heart prayers that I pray that you would have made if you haven't already is for salvation from God. You know, many people give a rote, a spelled out way to pray for salvation. And it's all biblical, but Jesus never tells us to pray this, this, and this for salvation. He says to believe, trust, turn, and follow me. And so with that, Will you pray from your heart that Christ would save you? Would you pray from your heart that you repent from sin and that you trust in Jesus? Pray from your heart that He will help you to walk in that every day. Again, it's not about the words. It's about your heart. And is your heart open to receive Christ as Savior today? You need to answer that question. So with that, if you feel that, if you feel your heart moved to do so, then pray with me. Pray these words. Again, it's not the words, it's the heart. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I've failed you. 
but I know that you went to the cross and that you died for my sins. And I want to believe in you today. I want to put my trust in you today. Make me new. Help me to live in light of you and your eternity from this day forth as a saved being by your grace. And it's not by my works, but by your work on the cross that I am saved. Amen. Friends, I pray that you receive Christ's salvation. If you have, shoot me a message. Let me know. Again, I'd love to pray for you, give you any resources I can to help you in that faith walk with Christ. Because it is a daily dying to self and living for Him. It is a daily seeking His will with all of our heart and being. It's not about our words. It's about our heart. Friends, I pray you have a blessed day. Again, shoot us a message. Leave us a comment. If we can pray for you in any way, we'd be glad to. Have a great week this week, friends.